Our freedom in Christ is not necessarily defined or restricted by our customs and traditions. So some may ask, what is truly pleasing to God? Today, His Eminence, Bishop Omega, answers these questions and more in a sermon titled, What is Acceptable to God? Subtitled, All Foods and All Peoples. Be edified and encouraged. Peace be unto you, saints, and praise the Lord. Now, to the sermon today. It's one I find very, very interesting, and I pray that you all will get something from it that will edify, that is to say, uplift you and also educate you. And what we're dealing with today is, and the title is, What is Acceptable to God? And of course, in parentheses, I've put all foods and all peoples, and we'll see how that's applicable as we go through this particular sermon today. Let me state at the beginning that this is divided into three sections because it's very important to understand what we're reading when we read the scriptures. And the reason I titled this, What is Acceptable to God, is because it's the very thing Jesus deals with as we are now in Mark, we're in the book of Mark today, but you'll see Jesus' response brings it right home as he often does. He gets right to the heart of the matter to show us what really is at issue here. What we have is a comparison of two ministries. We have the ministry of Jesus, which is one of healing, one of love, one of blessing and uplifting and enlightening. And then we have the other ministry of the Pharisees, which is one of hindering everything Jesus was for. Because theirs was a ministry of hypocrisy and self-righteousness, which, and believe it or not, self-righteousness is about the worst sin there is because in self-righteousness you have uh, encapsulated the thought that there's something righteous about you apart from God. And we know that man is nothing apart from God. So self-righteousness is perhaps the worst sin there is because in it you're saying Jesus Christ isn't sufficient. You're saying you have a little bit of, of righteousness and God is not really needed except here and there. And that's why people don't understand this, but self-righteousness is arguably the worst sin there is because in it you're actually denying God. And you'll see Jesus uses that actual phraseology. What we're going to deal with today <clears throat> in the first section is, is the danger, the dangers, make it plural, the dangers of tradition. Someone's going to say, what's wrong with tradition? Good traditions are fine. Yes, good traditions are fine. Traditions in general are fine until they transgress or cross the line into self-righteousness or rejection of God. And the second section we're going to deal with today is what actually defiles a person, meaning what actually makes a person unacceptable to God, what, unclean. And, un, and clean or unclean here means ceremonially, not hygienically. So when you hear that today, we're not talking about hygiene. We're talking about ceremonially clean or unclean. In other words, acceptable to God. And the third section we're going to deal with today is who is acceptable to God. The, the, the second section is what is and the third section will be who is acceptable to God. But I want to begin here at the uh, ending, the closing of chapter 6 in Mark, so we can see, just to highlight quickly, the healing ministry of Jesus and, and the, what his whole ministry was about. And then we'll contrast that to the ministry of the Pharisees, which was one of hindering, as we've just stated. So we'll begin here at the 6th sixth, sixth chapter of Mark and the 53rd verse. When they had, that, that is Jesus and disciples, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there, or came to shore there, anchored there. Verse 54, and when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him, ran through that whole surrounding region and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever uh, they heard he, Jesus, was. Whatever, uh, wherever he entered, into villages, cities, or, that, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might uh, just touch the hem or the border of his garment. And as many as touched him, meaning the border of his garment, were made well. Now, if you go back to uh, chapter 5, you'll see that Jesus healed the woman with the issue of blood just by the virtue going out of him because she touched the hem or the border of his garment, proving her faith pulled out of Jesus healing. So apparently this went around and spread throughout the region that 
If you just touch the hem of his garment, you'd be healed. So they brought all their sick. And you see Jesus in every village and town and the, what parts of the country he went, he was just healing people. That's what his ministry was about. He was fulfilling Isaiah 35, 5 and 6, that he would do these healing miracles. So when they heard about Jesus doing this, Jesus, and mind you how often Jesus, he worked so many hours a day, he went throughout the region from city to villages and different parts of the country just healing people because he's compassionate. And that's what his ministry is about. Then we come to chapter 7 of Mark, and we have an immediate contrast with the ministry of the Pharisees. Now, mind you, Pharisees and the scribes, these are the ones that are skilled in the law. They're, they're lawyer-like. They're very educated. They know exactly what the law says. They're familiar with all the customs and traditions. And the problem here we're going to see is that when tradition surplants God's original intent, that's when sin is present. And that is the problem, when tradition surplants God's original intent. And let me say this, by the way, before we even get to it. That has been a problem in many church organizations in Christendom today. They get caught up in tradition now. Tradition is fine until you start making that more important than the intent. For example, let's take baptism uh, in, in, in water, water baptism. We're not speaking here of baptism of the Holy Ghost. God does that immediately when you believe in Jesus, contrary to what some who are less informed believe. But we're talking, let's speak quickly about baptism uh, in water, water baptism. There are many traditions throughout all of Christendom, and I keep using this verbiage because I want you to get used to it. It just means anywhere people are true Christians. In all of Christendom, there are many ways of baptizing. And you will see certain churches and people's uh, congregations have broken up over traditions. Now, the intent is to be baptized with water to identify with Jesus. It's not to save you. It's to identify with Jesus. So if one person or one group of people, believers, baptize taking the body forward down into water, some kneel down in the water, some go backwards into the water. What is that to separate over? And that's when tradition messes up the original intent of the Lord to, to have people identify with him, to submerge in water. And then uh, in our very own tradition, uh, church, congregation, we used to have issues, and I've told this humorous joke, where the one woman was baptized three or four times until she finally said, listen, this was, they were baptizing way back in, I think, Bishop Johnson's day. And they said, do her again. Her hair didn't go under. Do her again. Her finger stuck up. Do her again. Her dress, uh, something didn't go under. And so she said, listen, I believe God set me as I is, meaning I believe God will accept me as I am. They baptized the woman three or four times. Now, the, the idea is, first of all, you don't see where it says every single aspect of the person has to be under the water. The purpose is to be submerged in water and to do the tradition, as Jesus said, to be baptized. Now, some say sprinkling is all right. I'm not arguing that. I'm saying the tradition of going down in water, fine. How you go down, what is that to argue over? That's where tradition divides people and tradition becomes sin. And you'll see that, and I say sin because it separates people and the original intent of God is lost. And then people get caught up in the tradition of the elders or meaning human beings, and you'll see Jesus addresses that himself. But my point is uh, to address this issue of tradition before we even get to reading it. And let me give you another thing. There's a tradition we have in our church, an organization, of dismissing with Jude, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory and mag. Right? Now, if we end a service one day by saying, amen, peace be unto you, or with a prayer, or in some other way, someone would say, they didn't dismiss correctly. Really? That is where tradition, we just made the tradition. The, 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 the Bible does not say you must end with Jude, what is it, 23 or 24, what is it? The Bible doesn't say that. We made it a tradition. But it's such a tradition that some people will say we didn't end service properly. It's a tradition to do it this way. Some people believe in opening service with a hymn or this, and if you don't do it, the tradition is broken, it's wrong. And as I already mentioned, the various ways of baptizing. People will say that is wrong because you didn't do it in a certain traditional way. And let's put this to the test now that we're talking about it. Do you know how many different ways, speaking of tradition, that people in Scripture 
were baptized. The verbiage, the wording that was used. In Acts 2.38, Peter says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be baptized. In Acts 10.48, it says they were baptized in the name of the Lord. Someone will say, yes, and then you have to say the name of the Lord. We know which Lord we're talking about. You're getting hung up over tradition. And notice the liberalism that is in the Christian faith. God allows many ways of doing something as long as the intent, his intent, original intent is there and the right heart. God allows liberality. Don't you understand? Don't we understand when it says there is liberty in Christ? Meaning we are no longer under that rigid law of Moses where things have to be done just to the letter of the law or it is wrong. And God did that on purpose to show man, the, the, the Hebrew people, their sins, that none of you follows the law exactly as God. If you did, you would be Christ. But when, he, when we come to the ministry of Jesus and the church, the liberalism, the freedom that is in Christ Jesus, we have the freedom to do it. I mentioned two ways of the people were baptized, right? In Acts 2.38, it's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts 10.48, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. In Acts 19.5, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus himself said, who can correct this? Jesus himself said to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And someone will say, well, the name of the Father is Jesus. It is not. The name of God the Father is God the Father. The name of, his, of the word, the Son, is Jesus. What's the name of the Holy Ghost? Someone's going to say it's Jesus. No, Jesus said, I send you another. We know he's one, but God is a triune Godhead. So to baptize in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are all correct because it's all Bible. And where tradition comes in and messes things up is when people say, but you weren't baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus himself, out of his own mouth, said to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Who's going to correct Jesus? I put it to you again. Someone will say, well, the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is Jesus. Incorrect. The name of the Son is Jesus. Because he's a triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's stated in Scripture. But tradition has come in and messed up so many people that some hearing me say this, and I've given you pure Bible, some hearing me say this will say, that's wrong. He's not right. You have to only baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Peter said. All right, what are you going to do with what, the other, what Jesus said? He said, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. It's all right to use Jesus' exact words and baptize someone. It is also all right to baptize them forward, to baptize them backwards, to have them kneel. To go. The point being made here is tradition can mess people up. This is the these are the dangers of tradition. What? That you may, through self-righteousness, think you are more righteous than you are. And, as Jesus says here, you reject the commandments of God for the commandments or the traditions or the precepts of humans, of men, of the elders. And that is a danger that people don't realize. Some, I, I say this for the record, some listening to me now thinking, oh, he's gone a bit too far now. But I've heard that when I first started preaching that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Some of you listening to me right now, if you would be honest in your heart, you know you said, that's not right. And yet I gave you scripture after scripture after scripture. Some of you have come around, m most of you have, because you actually read for yourselves and you can now rightly divide the word of God. And what is insulting, I would say, is when unlearned or unstudied individuals would dare say something is wrong after much study has been given to it, and then we'll see as we get into the scriptures today, you'll see Jesus backs up what I'm saying today. That watch out for traditions. Because the traditions of men will have you rejecting God and his original intent. And don't forget this. In Christianity, in the church era, there is a lot of liberalism given. Now let me, for the record, because I know there are some say, so he's saying that people can do what they want. No, do you understand that worship is an individual thing? We're going to get to that. I don't want to jump ahead, but worship, the way you worship might not be the way I worship. The way I worship might not be the way this person worships. That's why God, Jesus said himself, God is looking for those who worship him what? In spirit. That means your inner spirit, you individually. Now, the way I do it is going to be different from you because we are different individuals. So 
when he says he's looking for those who worship him in spirit and in truth, he wants you to be true about it and he wants you to do it from within. Outward shows of worship are just that, outward shows of worship. Nothing wrong with tradition as long as you are doing what God says. God says, I'm looking for people to worship me from within. It says worship him in spirit and in truth. It means in you, in your man, in your human spirit. Obviously, that speaks to the fact that it's going to be individualized. A corporate, like uh, the body worshiping is fine. Why do you think God accepts someone's uh, singing from the heart who does not have the most beautiful voice, yet someone who has a beautiful voice and they're not from intent, their, their intention is not uh, to God, but to show off how beautiful their voice is alone. Whose singing do you think God accepts? Mother so-and-so who's off key, but her heart is right, rather than so-and-so who sings so beautifully, but he or she is there to show off how beautiful their voice is. It's nothing wrong with a beautiful voice. God gave you the voice. My point here is when the intention of your worship singing or your playing is, is from the heart, when the intention is from the heart and is sincere in spirit and in truth, God accepts it. When it is self-seeking, God does not accept it. It has become now tradition to do this, or it's become self-seeking for you to sing or do this. It's nothing wrong with wanting to sing. It's nothing wrong with wanting to do anything for the Lord, to the Lord in worship, if it's done with the right intent. If it is only done to glorify yourself, don't you know God gets no praise from it? So here's where tradition is bad. If it brings, about, uh, brings out self-righteousness, produces, or if it rejects the original intent that God had for a particular thing. Now you're gonna see when we get here to the washing of the hands, there, the objection that the Pharisees had about Jesus' disciples not washing their hands before they ate had nothing to do with hygiene. And this is what most people do not understand. And you'll see Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter and brings out what the cause is. Let's start reading, so then we'll be able to open this up further. Now we're at uh, chapter 7 of Mark, verse 1. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Look how far they came. They came from Jerusalem to the region Jesus was up in uh, Gennesaret. They traveled a long way just to see if they can trap Jesus. Now you see Jesus had a ministry of healing. They have a ministry of hindering. And they came all this way, some leading officials from the Pharisees and the scribes, they came just to see if they can trap Jesus. And so they're looking for anything they can use. And you'll notice they hone right in on the washing of the disciples' hands. And you, let me read further, then we'll clarify. Now, when they saw some of his, Jesus' disciples, eat bread with defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. They came all the way from Jerusalem to where Jesus was in Gennesaret to find fault. And they were looking for any occasion. Now, let's explain something. For the, let, let me read further. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders, of humans, not necessarily what was written in the law, but what has come down. When people say, well, this is what the law meant. You have to do it this way, this way. It's become tradition. It's called the tradition of the elders. When, uh, when they uh, come from the marketplace, this is the, the Jews still speaking. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. They're telling you what the Jews do is what I'm saying. They do not eat unless they wash, meaning when it says marketplace, meaning from out in public. And that's where most people in, those, in that day met was in the marketplace. They didn't have towns and cities like we do today as such. So the marketplace was considered the common place where everybody was. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, traditions they hold to, like washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels or brazen bronze vessels, and uh, tables, and some have couches. Then the Pharisees and the scribes ask him, why do your disciples not walk according to the, the tradition of the elders, but eat bread, meaning eat food, with unwashed hands? And we'll get to Jesus' answer in a minute. Now, let us understand what's going on here. As I said earlier, they are not at all calling Jesus' disciples dirty or unhygienic. They are not concerned here with hygiene. Let us explain. And this is where you must do your homework. There was a certain way the Jews had to wash their hands according to tradition. That is to say, they would hold their both hands upward. Someone else had to pour water over your hands. 
Then they would hold their hands downward. Someone else had to pour water over your hands. Then the third process in this ritualized, traditional way of, uh, that has come down, they would have to use the fist to wash the actual both hands and use the fist. If you didn't do it that way, they considered you ceremonially unclean. Now, let's say they saw Jesus' disciples just rinse in some water and then go eat. So they weren't concerned with the fact that no water or little water was used, they weren't concerned with hygiene. They were concerned that it wasn't, we don't see your disciples having someone else pour their hand, pour water this way, and then wash with the fist, and then wash with the fist. They said, we don't see that. So they said they're unclean, according to the tradition of the elders. Look at verse, uh, the ending part of verse 3. They do not hold to the, to the tradition of the elders. I'm excited about this one, saints, because you have to understand this as, is what, we in this organization have also adapted traditions taking precedence over the intent that the, the word may have had for a particular action like baptism and like we have uh, come with our traditions of dismissal or a certain what we call order of service. If it's not done like that, it wasn't right. They didn't have proper service. Where is it written? Where is it written? You have to look and find scripture. Now, also, the Lord allowed, you'll see in the book of Acts, the Lord rarely, if ever, does the same thing the exact way more than once. What was he showing us? The intent is what matters. And not so much the ritualistic traditions that have come down over the years that human beings started. And I want you to see the Lord himself, our Lord, is going to use that very wording. He says, well, let, let's get to it. Verse 6. Jesus, this is Jesus answering. He says, uh, he answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. These are little things you must stop and pay attention to. Why did Jesus call them hypocrites? What is a hypocrite? Well, it comes from someone who is not real, someone who is insincere, someone who is acting, someone who is putting on fronting as the uh, ver uh, vernacular goes. Jesus says, well did Isaiah say of you hypocrites, as it is written, now he's quoting Isaiah, and this is Isaiah 29, 13. Jesus quotes Isaiah saying, this people uh, honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and in vain, meaning it means nothing. I want you to pay attention to this wording. In vain do they worship me. What did I say? You're out there singing, and if it's not for the Lord, what are, you, what are you singing for? In vain. In vain means it counts for nothing. Jesus says, quoting Isaiah, in vain do they worship me. And what did I say we're going to get to? Jesus says, teaching for doctrines, teaching for pure truth, the commandments of men. What human beings made up? Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men, of human beings, of the elders meaning what has come down, and what are traditions that have come down to be, uh, that, that have come down as now um, doctrine, which is not doctrine. It's when people try to interpret what a particular law meant, and then over the years, you take more of what the interpretation was, or the tradition of that original law, and you say, now that's it, rather than uh, seeing what the law meant. Now, remember that one scripture that says, um, you shall not um, uh, muzzle the mouth of the oxen that treads out the wheat or the grain? Then Paul made it clear, said, do you think God was concerned with animals? No, he was saying a, a laborer is worthy of his hire. That's why Jesus said, yes, preachers can receive remuneration for preaching because they're worthy of their hire. His point, if someone is working, pay them. Right? But I like the way Paul says, now do you think he was concerned with animals? So when you misinterpret something or, or, misinter or interpret it incorrectly, then traditions can derive from that, which people tend to follow more stringently than the intent of the original scripture. So when, when we're told to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, to baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were baptized in the name of the Lord, and they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Why are you getting hung up over traditions that you have come to practice when clearly in Acts I just highlighted four different ways people were baptized using certain wording? I hope you're getting what I'm saying here. Now, Jesus himself says, teaching as doctrines or for doctrines, the commandments, what men have ordered, what human beings have ordered, the commandments of men. That's why I said, when you go away from what God has said, you're now rejected, you're rejecting what God has. When this is the danger of tradition, you can reject what God intended. And then there's a certain self-righteousness because we were baptized this way. We did it right, but you weren't. What is that? We're a little better than you. That, that is where self-righteousness comes in. And Jesus is saying for himself, that is wrong. Now, for laying aside, listen, this is what Jesus himself says. I want you to see this. This is the Lord. For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold to the traditions of men. Jesus just said the danger of traditions is when you lay aside, reject what God has intended. I want you to see that that's right there. Please look at verse 8 again. And let me read it in the classical. For laying aside the commandments of God, ye hold the tradition of men. And Jesus goes on to say, as washing the pots and the cups and many other such, uh, many other such like things ye do. What did I say? Many other things you do. The way you dismiss service has to be done like this. Who said, where is it written? Show me exactly in the Bible where it's written said you must always dismiss using that quote out of Jude. That's a tradition. We had nothing wrong with using that. Understand me, nothing wrong. But I'm saying when you say someone else is wrong for not doing it, what if I read another scripture to dismiss? It has become a tradition. But someone will say, oh, elder so-and-so didn't say now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you. Fall is for the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, and power. For, no. No, how did he dismiss? He said, well, saints, let us be dismissed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace, peace be unto you. He didn't dismiss correctly. Same with him. How did you get baptized? In the name of the Lord Jesus. There's only one Lord Jesus I know. Do you know another? So how is it wrong? Do you see where traditions have often led to schisms in the church, dividing? Certain family members won't even speak to each other. Certain church members, they've stopped and joined other churches or other you know, congregations and call that a new church. This has been our tradition in Christianity, unfortunately, because we, we hold to traditions and let them divide us. Listen to this. Again, Jesus says, let, let me read on to verse 9, and I'll read the classical King James. And he said to them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, and ye keep your own tradition. So what is the danger of tradition? That you reject what God has. I want you to see this. Jesus said it. So don't, don't lay it to my charge. Jesus said this in verse 9. I'll read it in the modern. First of all, he started at verse 8 by saying, Laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the traditions of men, the washing of pitchers or and cups and many other such things you do. Then he goes on to verse 9. And he said, he added, said to them, all too well you reject. I want you to help stay on that word for a minute. You reject the, what God said do. God said love one another. He didn't say call somebody slack for not dismissing by using that reference in Jude. He didn't say that. But some people say that. Oh, Elder so-and-so didn't dismiss with now unto him. Where is it written you have to do that? I want you to pay attention. Pay, pay attention. These are the dangers of tradition. When you end up rejecting the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition, things you've come up with. Someone says, that woman didn't have on an eight-inch dress? How is she living a holy life? How is she? If you want to wear dresses that are eight inches from the ground, fine. But please, if you're going to condemn someone, show me where it's scripture. Where does it come from? Oh, the tradition of human beings. So God said, through his word, dress modestly. God said, let the Holy Ghost guide you in all that you do. Well, the Holy Ghost doesn't have you coming to church looking like you're going to a nightclub. However, there's no strict edict as to how one must dress. He came to church. He didn't even have on a tie. Look at Bishop preaching without a tie. And what's your point? Tell me, show me where Jesus wore a tie ever. Someone will say, well, in his day, ah, so it changes from era to era, day to day, custom to custom, culture to culture. It does change, doesn't it? Because there's liberality 
in Christ Jesus. Please don't go to the other extreme and say, oh, I can do whatever I want. I'm not saying that. My point is when tradition drives you away from the original intent of the word, then you have a problem. And that's why Jesus said, you reject what God has said, and you made up your own things that you follow. And now to you, that's more holy to keep than actually what's in the word of God. These are the, the dangers of tradition. Am I saying stop tradition? No, traditions are fine as long as you don't cross the line with traditions into self-righteousness and rejection of what God has ordained and what God has commanded. And we, if you know your New Testament, you know there is a lot of liberty in Christ. There are many ways of worship, and we are going to get to that in a minute. And let me finish out this section before we, uh, I want to stop at verse 14, and then we'll move on to the next section. Uh, listen, now Jesus gives it, backs it up with another example. He says, verse 9, he says, uh, uh, he said to them, all too well you reject, pay attention to that, saints, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. Then he gives an example. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. Now, notice Jesus said, honor your father and mother, meaning respect them. And if anyone curses or disrespects their parents in such a vile way, you were worthy of death under the law of Moses. Now, he says, but I say... Uh, uh, he said, but you say, I'm sorry, but Jesus says, talking to the Pharisees and the scribes, he said, but you say, if a man says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corbin. Corbin just means set aside for the purpose of God. In other, in other words, no, I was going to use this money to give to the temple. I was going to give this for God, so I can't give it to you, mother or father. Yet you were given, what was God's commandment? Honor your father and mother. Take care of them in their old age if, or if they need anything. You, take, you honor your father and mother and you can't even speak a, a word ill against them. This is what it's saying, right? Now, we're, we're talking all things being equal. I'm not talking about someone who's in an abusive family and the, 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 you're being half killed or sexually molested and all this kind of stuff. You have to honor your father and mother. Yeah, uh-huh. Use your common sense that the Holy Ghost gave you as well. But he's saying here, all things being equal, honor your father and mother. And he says, and if you curse them, the law of Moses says you must die. And Jesus says, but you say, you find a way. Jesus said, he, in a way, Jesus is saying, you all are slick. You even found a way to keep money or, or support from your parents by saying, oh, this is Corbin. That's a Hebrew term, which means this is holy unto the Lord. I can't give it to you, dad. I can't give it to you, mom. I was intended on giving this to the temple at some point in the future, whenever, but I can't give it to you. Sort of a way of holding something from them because you don't want to give it to your parents. And if dishonoring your parents or cursing them was worthy of death, what is this? Not to take care of them when you know you should or you have the means to, you, you, you're supposed to. But you say, verse 11, Jesus says, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is Corbin, that is, a gift to God, then you no longer uh, let him do anything for his father or mother. Jesus is saying, you Pharisees make it all right for people to disrespect their parents, yet you're worrying about my disciples not properly ceremonially washing their hands in the way that has become a tradition ordained by men. Jesus is making a point here, yet you, with your slick selves, you found a way to keep support from your own parents, and you make this person feel it's all right, making the word of God of none effect through your traditions which you have handed down, and many such, and many such other things he's saying you do. Do you see what Jesus just told them? You're hypocrites. You found a way to get around the law of Moses when you want to, even when it involves people's own parents. You made it all right for people to neglect their father and their mother by saying, oh, this is Corbin. This is a gift to God. I can't give it to you, Dad. You're hungry? Well, I was going to give it to you, but I already dedicated this for the Lord. Well, aren't you serving the Lord by helping your parents? You hypocrite, he's saying. You haven't seen God himself to help him. How do you do it? By helping one another. Anyway, he's saying you found a slick way around the law of Moses, he's saying, didn't you? He's almost complimenting them in the sense that saying, you, you, you people are really slick. You found a way to withhold from your parents by making it a tradition, by saying, well, if you, if you dedicate that money to the Lord, then you don't have to take care of your father and mother. That's what I meant by he's almost complimenting them. He's saying, you're really slick, aren't you? So we see that Jesus made it the point there that tradition can be dangerous. 
the dangers of tradition, self-righteousness and hypocrisy, rejection of what God said to implement what man says. That is the danger of tradition. And just for the record, let me end this section one by saying, I am not saying stop tradition. I am not saying stop dismissing with that reference in Jude. I am not saying do not baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know someone's going to misconstrue what I'm saying here. So I have to put this in the record. I'm saying when tradition supersedes or transgress or nullifies the true intent of God's uh, uh, commandment, then you have a problem with tradition. And also when it supplants the, uh, the core meaning of a particular scripture, then you have a problem with tradition. Now we're moving on to Jesus making the point since they're saying your disciples, uh, they're, they're, they're defiled. Defiled means unclean or unacceptable to God. So they're saying the traditions, they don't wash their hands this way with having someone else pour. And then this way that the water poured down, someone else poured. And as long as the water pours off, covers down to the wrist, that was all considered part of the hand. You were considered ceremonially clean, and especially when you ended it with the fist washing hand in hand. So now Jesus is going to make the point. Since you're speaking of what's defiled before God, what's unacceptable to God, let us talk about foods. Since you said they eat meat, meats just mean here food. Doesn't mean bread just means here food. Doesn't mean natural only bread. Jesus says, let me clarify what really does uh, corrupt a person or defile a person. And then he goes on. And don't forget, the, um, the Jewish uh, society in that day, and even today for the, the, the orthodoxy, are strict uh, traditionalists, and they believe in keeping the traditions. And some of them, uh, some keep traditions so much so, uh, so rigidly that some have forgotten what the original law is, but they know what the, the traditions are. So Jesus is saying here, uh, what we're about to get to in, in section uh, 2, which is uh, verses 14 through 23, what we're about to cover now in the 7th chapter of Mark. Now we're talking about what actually defiles a person. What makes a person unclean, unacceptable to God? And Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter as always. When he called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, uh, everyone, and understand. There is nothing... Would you please come back? This is the, these are the words of Jesus. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile him. Now, now notice he adds here, and some say the original manuscripts may not have this, but listen to this, verse 16. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Whenever you see Jesus saying that, he's saying, pay attention and listen and learn. Read beyond just mere the lines. He says, listen to the depths of what I'm saying. That's what Jesus means by, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. In other words, we would say today, man, check this out. Understand what I'm saying. He's not so concerned with what goes into, now why am I, what goes into a person? Why is Jesus saying that? Because in the tradition, Jewish tradition, shellfish, lobsters, crabs, uh, you name it, the, all forbidden. Uh, pork, of course, forbidden. Certain animals with hooves a certain way, and all, forbidden, according to the law of Moses. And Jesus' point here is, that law of Moses was done to highlight your sin. But Jesus is saying the actual, what, is, what makes someone unacceptable, unclean to God. It is not the food that goes in. God gave you those rigid dietary laws to show you the weakness and the sin. That's what the law is there for, to show and highlight the sin in man. The law was never to save you. If anyone could be saved by fulfilling the law, someone would have done it. The only one that fulfilled the law was Jesus who didn't need saving. No one else could do it. So the law was there to sh highlight and show you your sin and show you how you are not like God, nor are you as good as you think you are, mankind, without God's grace and without God accepting you. So Jesus makes it very clear. That's why he says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He's saying, listen to this. When he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, are you thus without understanding also? You still don't get it. At first he told the multitude, right? Now he says, he took them aside, his disciples, and went to a, a house 
indefinite article, and said, which means some house, not the house, as it refers to in another place, talking about Peter's house or their main meeting place. Well, he, here he went into a house, and he, his, his disciples asked him, what did you mean by that, what you just said? He says, are you also without, are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive, don't you understand, he's saying, that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him. Listen, what Jesus is doing right here is also saying that all foods are equal. He said, did you hear him? He said, whatever enters a man from the outside, because it doesn't touch your soul, doesn't touch your spirit, it only touches the natural. And then Jesus says it comes out in waste. And by that, purging all meats or purifying all foods. By that, Jesus just said, really, you can eat anything you want. Now, here again, he that has an ear, let him hear. He is not saying for someone who says, oh, really? I can eat pork. I like pork, but I have high blood pressure. Then you don't eat pork. Or you have a, an, an, al an allergy to shellfish. Then you don't eat shellfish. But my point is, it doesn't make you, as Jesus is saying, it doesn't make you unclean to God. It doesn't defile you to have consumed it naturally. And he gives the reason. Do, do you not perceive, don't you understand that whatever enters a man from the outside can't make you ceremonially unclean or unacceptable to God, cannot defile you, because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach. It enters your natural. It doesn't enter the inner spirit of a person. Jesus just said it himself. You can't argue with the words of Jesus. But again, I am not endorsing that you now should start eating pork if you know your body can't take it or you don't like it, that's fine. Jesus is just saying it doesn't make you unclean to God. What's today's sermon? What is acceptable to God? All foods and all peoples. And we'll see how he cleverly throws that in at the end of this passage. But look, go back to verse 19. Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, comes out in the joint. Thus purging or purifying all foods, meaning thus by doing that. In other words, when you eat and then you get rid of it, it went in the physical and came out of the physical. Didn't touch your spirit at all, the inner person. Didn't defile you, didn't make you unclean. So foods, he is saying here, has nothing to do with you being acceptable to God, nor the food itself. Is it rejected or unacceptable to God? Remember the dream that Peter had? And he saw all manner of things coming down on the great cloth. And he said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter being such a traditional Jew, he said, no, these lips have never touched anything unclean. Even in his dream, he's opposing the Lord. It shows you how ingrained tradition was in the Jewish society. But of course, later the Lord touched Peter and his understanding and it opened up. And was he even talk, talking about foods? His main purpose was you cannot reject Gentiles. I came first. And we'll get to that as we close. I came first for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But God always opened up salvation and had a plan from the foundation of the world to save all humanity Jewish or otherwise, but we'll get to that. And he, and he said, what comes out of a man, that's what defiles him. Now listen to what he's saying, why? For from within, out of the heart of a man proceeds evil. From within, in other words, then he goes on to give you examples. He says, what comes out of you shows what's really in your inner person, in your thinking. Not what goes in you. That can't make you unclean, defiled, or unacceptable to God. It's what emanates from within you because therein are your thoughts, That's your, intention, your intentions, and that comes from the heart, meaning the inner person, the soul of a person. So Jesus makes it very clear here what actually defiles a person in our section two here, verses 14 to 23. He says, he makes it very clear, for from within, out of the heart of men, human beings, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, and an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile a person. Do you see, saints, what defiles a person? What makes you unacceptable? Not the traditions or keeping or not keeping traditions, not what you eat or don't eat. He was really showing them there, and notice he's talking to a Jewish crowd. He was showing them there, your, your traditions are fine, but when you understand them properly and when the law is enacted correctly, 
and understood correctly. Not when through the traditions of human beings, elders, men, same thing, through the traditions of human beings that have come down, you've now taken traditions and you've rejected the commandments of God. And you find more important to keep traditions. We only have to wear white on convention Sunday. She didn't have on her white. Well, the tradition's nothing wrong with it. But what if she didn't have a white dress? It's a tradition that we started as human beings. We wear suits. Now I know what someone's gonna say, I don't have to wear, now you have a defiant spirit. If you had a white dress and you know it's our tradition, why not wear it if they said that as the rule of Convention Sunday? But it's not anything about righteousness, it's just uniformity. In fact, the very word is in there, uniform. And men that wear suits, it's our tradition to wear a suit and tie. In fact, in the old days, it used to be called your Sunday go meeting clothes or your Sunday best, because usually you reserve your best clothing for the Lord's house. It was a tradition. It's not a rule from God. Jesus never, they didn't have suits like we have today. I know some probably in their hearts said, why doesn't Bishop wear a suit when he preaches on Sunday? Why aren't you listening to the word when I'm preaching on Sunday? That's the most important thing. Why are you caring about my haberdashery? It's, it, 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 it's amazing how people get sidetracked with tradition. And then you get so hung up in it that you find that more important to emphasize than the intent. The person is in church, at least. They are there. Perhaps their heart is better than yours, more righteous than yours, because you're sitting there judging another person's haberdashery. And your mind should be on these past scriptures we just went over. The traditions of men can be dangerous. And also what defiles a person is not what goes into a person, but instead, as Jesus said, what comes out because it comes out of the heart. And there is where you think of uh, adulteries, cheating on your spouse. There is where you think of thefts and stealing and deceit, lying and talking about other saints and, and all that. That's where it all emanates from within. That makes you unlike God, not what you eat. Now we get to the third section, and this is who is acceptable to God. Now notice it looks like it looks like the, the, the story totally changes here until you realize what is being done here. Notice something, and this is I like to conclude with, is a very important, and pay attention to this, saints, please, because this, this requires an ear that hears. From there, verse 24, this is section three, and what are we, what are we talking about here? What, uh, who is acceptable to God? That's our se third section. From there he, uh, he arose and went into the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, first of all, you notice Jesus' ministry is to the Jews. But notice here he went to what was then called Syrophoenicia because it is what is today's Lebanon. But in those days, this part of Phoenicia was a providence of Syria. So you'll see she's called here a Syrophoenician woman. And yet I'll take you to another reference where she's called a Canaanite, meaning a descendant of those who were originally in what is today's Israel, a Canaanite. But let's, let's get to this in a minute. From there, he, Jesus, arose and went into a region, to the region of Tyre, in, in today's Lebanon, and Sidon, today's Lebanon, Phoenician people. And he entered a house, again, an indefinite article, a house, not the house. So it's, it's some house, we're not told here which. He entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. In other words, Jesus wanted, didn't want people to know he was there, but the word got out. Do you know who's in this region? That man that does all that healing back there in Israel. And, and uh, he, he's in our region. So the word got out. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit uh, heard about Jesus, heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, meaning non-Jewish or of the Greek culture. We just heard that, I just told you that she's a, of a Canaanite descent. We'll get to that in a minute. We'll go to another reference. And she's a, of the uh, Syro-Phoenician or Syrian Lebanese region. So, but it says Greek here, meaning of the Greek culture, because the Greek culture was dominant and it meant non-Jewish. Verse 26, the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs. And there he means pet, not uh, scrungy street roaming dogs. He's talking about little dogs or pets that people may have had around the house. And notice he's speaking to that uh, Syrophoenician woman because it was commonplace for them to have dogs in the house, not so much for Jews. 
uh, and that's why G dogs are considered unacceptable. That's why he said it is not uh, meat. Now, it sounds like Jesus is insulting the woman. We'll get to that in a minute. He's not. He's drawing out her faith in a gracious and kind way. And she said, verse 28, and she said, uh, she answered and said, yes, Lord, yet even uh, the little dogs, meaning the pets, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. He said to her, uh, for this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found uh, the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. Now, in order to properly understand this, we have to go to another reference, which also covers that particular encounter, but it has more detail. Now we're going to Matthew 15, 21 to properly understand that story we just saw in Mark, which is redacted, if you will. Now, we're starting at uh, Matthew 15, 21. Now, this is so good, but let's conclude with this, but this is so good, you must understand what's going on here. And the research, I, I got happy researching this and finding this out for myself. I didn't realize it before. Pay attention to this, saints. Very subtle. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon, same place we were in Mark 24, Mark uh, 7, 24. But we're starting here with the same account, a few more details in here, but essential details in Matthew uh, 15, 21. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and, and Sidon, again in Lebanon. And behold, a woman of Canaan, so she was a Canaanite descendant, her descendancy was Canaanite, though she was living in the region of the Syrophoenician part, which was a providence, a providence, uh, I'm sorry, a province in or owned by Syria then, controlled by Syria, though it is today's Lebanon, Tyre and Sidon, two cities of Lebanon, or Phoenicia. That's the ancient name for Lebanon. Uh, verse 22. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. That's the key right there. You didn't see that in Mark, did you? But notice this, this is why we have to look at all the references and then compile the full meaning of the story. I want you to pay attention to that. She added, O oh Lord, yes, she did say Lord, but she said she added son of David because she knew that de Jesus is that long awaited or heard of talked about Messiah claimed by the Jews the believing those who were following Jesus, they said he's that fulfillment of the son of David. Son of David always referred to the Jewish Messiah. Listen to this. My daughter, she says, is severely demon-possessed. Verse, 20, verse 23. But he answered her not a word. Now, you didn't see that in Mark. Here, Matthew is telling us that Jesus did this. He didn't answer her. He didn't pay her any attention. Now, he's not being mean. Jesus is not mean. He's compassionate. What is Jesus doing? Well, let's read on. I'll tell you, I'll give you a heads up. He's drawing out her faith. Now, this woman's a Gentile. He came for whom? Let's read on. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, for she cries after us. But he said, uh, he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of Israel. Then she came and fell down, worshiped at Jesus' feet and said to him, now notice this, Lord, help me. Notice what she did not say the second time. She did not add son of David. Why? Well, let's read on. But he answered and said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the, do to the dogs. And she said, meaning little dogs or pets, not the scramsley dogs in the street. And she said, so he was not insulting her by saying that. But she knew something about Jewish tradition. And that's why she says, yes, Lord, no son of David again. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the, ta the master's table. Then Jesus answered her and said, O woman, great is your faith. He was drawing out her faith. Great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Now let's explain this. The reason Jesus said nothing to her, because she used the verbiage, the title son of David. And he says to his disciples, I have not come except to the lost sheep of Israel. When she appealed to him on the basis of being the Jewish Messiah, he could do nothing for her. Because at this advent, this time on earth, he came for the lost and he had to present to them first salvation and healings and all this to the lost sheep of Israel. But when she pled to him on the basis of help me, Lord, no son of David, Lord shows you that God is willing to hear and save and help anyone who desires him and pleads with him just on the basis of Lord, not son of David, because son of David was throwing in the connotation that 
the Jewish Messiah is here. Help me on the basis of that. He says, no, I'm here for the lost sheep of Israel on my first advent to earth. But on the basis of crying to God just as Lord, then he could help her. That's why he helped her on her second cry to him, not on the first cry. Now, he wasn't being mean. What he was doing was drawing out her faith. And he did graciously draw out her faith to, as she dropped that term, son of David, and she just said, look, I'm desperate. You know, any mother for their child. And she just cried to him, Lord, meaning I know you are sovereign. You're the only one that can help me. But she didn't throw in son of David. So Jesus is saying, on this basis, I can now help you. Woman, at this saying, what you said just saved your daughter. Go home. She's already healed. Because she appealed to him on the grounds not of the uh, long-awaited Jewish Messiah. He's there for the lost sheep of Israel first. He has to offer them first. And at this first coming, he came for the lost sheep of Israel and to help the lost sheep. But God is so gracious. Look at how gracious spilled over into the Greek slash Gentile slash Syrophoenician world. And he even helped a woman who just pled to him on the basis of God help me, Lord help me. And what is the Lord telling us here? He always hears anybody who calls on him on the basis of faith alone. But when she called on him on the basis of being the Jewish Messiah, at this time he could do nothing for her because he had already ordained, the God had already ordained that you are sent now to earth for the lost sheep of Israel first. Salvation is of the Jews. Take it to the Jews first. That's the way God had it. And so when she pled to him the, the, the second and third time, she said, I know, Lord, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Even, I know you came here to feed him. He says children, he meant the Jews. The, they're the actual children of the vine, the original vine. So he said, I know, she's saying, I know, but can I just appeal to you on the basis of, Lord, help me. I like what she just said, Lord. She said, then she said, came to him saying, and worshiped again, saying, Lord, help me. How could Jesus refuse her? And God is telling us that. How can God refuse anyone who comes to him on the basis of, Lord, help me? You remember uh, Hagar? God heard her crying when she and her son Ishmael were out. And God came and helped her. I heard you. When you appeal to him, he doesn't care who you are. So what is this third section? Who is acceptable to God? Well, I'll tell you. All are acceptable to God in the sense that all that come to God in faith are received. And what is acceptable to God? Anything that is not defiled. What isn't defiled? Anything that in God's eyes is clean. So all foods are clean to God in terms of being defiled or unceremonially unclean. And all people are acceptable to God when you come on the basis of Lord help me. So to conclude today, let us just say, what is acceptable to God? Anyone that comes to God in faith. Who is acceptable to God? Anyone that comes to God in faith. And remember this, all foods and all peoples are acceptable to God on the basis of cleanliness and, un and, and uh, lack of cleanliness. Do not think that God favors one person over another, one dietary plan over another. If it doesn't hurt your health, eat what you want. And when it comes to people, show favoritism to no one, but show love to all, as God does accept anyone who comes to him in faith. And that is what is acceptable to God. God bless each and every one of you. Continue to read the word, pray for one another, love one another, forgive one another, be gentle with one another. Peace be unto you until next time. God bless you all.